Itzhak Perlman, a famous violinist, said it well. He said, every phrase of music has a purpose. It's like talking. When you talk with a purpose, people listen. If you just repeat, it's not as meaningful. My name is Blaine Gale. I was born in Payson, Utah on Mother's Day of 1933, and my parents met singing, and music has been part of my life. Eat, sleep, music, all part of life. I've been playing the theater organ here at the organ loft for almost a quarter of a century for silent film live accompaniment. My name is Larry Bray. I'm the uh, proprietor here at uh, Edison Street Organ Loft, and I've been doing this for 36 years. Um, the place has actually been here in my family since 1946, and um, we have something quite unique and different here that we're very proud of. I go by E. Hunter Hale. I got interested in films with my brother when uh, I was 11 years old. Uh, we started making 8mm silent movies and uh, we soon learned that they worked better with uh, music added. Uh, when I was a teenager, we uh, had the opportunity to come down to the organ loft, and I was absolutely amazed as I looked around at this place, and I, I wanted to make a, a sound short about it, so I wrote uh, RKO Radio Pictures on uh, my Halo Studios stationery and told them about this great place, and they said, go ahead and make it. We won't put any money in it. But uh, we'd be glad to see the finished film. Uh, my uncle Lawrence Bray uh, became so intrigued with the sound of theater pipe organ, uh, he decided that he was going to get one when he got out of the Navy. And the first one that he acquired was right out of the Utah Theater uptown here. And uh, his aunt that lives next door had a chicken coop, and he just decided to put it in that. And before you know it, he started getting it going and working. And, uh, then people started flocking to see what he was doing. And he started with the, the Morton instrument, and then he sold the majority of that and purchased the two, three manual consoles that came out of Staten and Island, New York, and that was in 1960. And then probably in about 63, uh, he purchased the one out of the Egyptian theater in Ogden and, and added uh, to that. And um, about that time is when we added a dance floor and we started getting uh, organists that would play dance music. We had a drummer and so we started to be open on Saturday nights every night for, uh, for dancing. First started working here when I was about 13. I used to buff the black and white tiles underneath this carpet and uh, then I started doing more um, physical projects and, and helping him uh, do more things with the organ and learning how to take care of it. And um, he died in 1982, and so basically I've been running it since, since 82. Well, uh, when we first started out uh, in the 50s and 60s, the, we did mostly concerts. Uh, Gus Varney and a few other uh, organists would play concerts. And then as the organ started to expand, a lot more uh, organists from different uh, states would come in and do concerts, and then we started doing dance parties. And then he started doing uh, private functions like uh, dinner banquets and, and receptions, Christmas parties, that sort of thing. Yeah, we just started our silent films probably about 25 years ago. And we started out with a regular uh, 60 millimeter projector and I have some friends that uh, collect and uh, so we started showing those. And then uh, eventually went to uh, DVDs because of the quality and the remastering of them it was so much better than the films that we could get a hold of. As years went by, I had the opportunity to come down here and, and watch a gentleman from the University of Utah record, have recordings made for his silent uh, Super 8 movies. And I soon realized that uh, silent movies were never intended to be silent and they were never seen that way with the public. And uh, with the theater organ, it, uh, it became an entirely different experience of uh, watching a so-called silent film. Uh, they did a few public showings at that time, and uh, when this gentleman found out that I had an interest in silent film and that I knew something about him, he uh, pretty well turned it over to me, and so I started programming uh, films on a regular basis for the organ loft 
figuring out which films to play, figuring out how to advertising it uh, to get uh, information out to the newspapers. And uh, for the past, oh, probably 25 years, we've uh, been doing uh, programs on a regular basis. The instrument itself and the place is quite well known because it's been around since 1946 and you'd be surprised at the number of people I run into that, that say, oh, my grandmother used to come over here and dance every Saturday night and, and so uh, people is the best part. The experience of, um, of the organ loft is really quite unique because we have uh, we work together as a team. Uh, it's done out of love. I mean, you have Larry Bray, he doesn't, who owns this place, who took it over from his uncle. He doesn't play the organ, but he keeps the organ in tune, or tries to keep it in tune. It's an ongoing progress, or process all the time. He uh, uh, works with, uh, out of love, of this wonderful instrument. And then we have uh, Blaine, who uh, over, over the years has become better and better and better at uh, accompanying a silent film. And then we have my brother and I who uh, love not only silent film, but uh, great sound films. And we've had the opportunity of, of taking the knowledge we have and being able to put it into a, a process that we can share with other people. Okay, this is one of four chambers in the, uh, the Holy Instrument, and this is a rather large chamber. We have 11 ranks in this chamber, and uh, actually a rank consists of anywhere from 16-foot octave up to 2-foot octave, and there's two types. You have a reeded pipe and you have a fluted pipe. A church organ has stops, voices they're called, that we are all familiar with because we hear them all the time in church settings. The theater organ, instead of having the standard church organ stops, has some of those also, but it emulates what a orchestra does or a band. It sets its pipes to sound more like trumpets or more like violins, more like clarinets and so forth. That makes it a unit orchestra, which is the way it was named when it was invented by Robert Hope Jones. Um, yes, that and uh, that it is, it's highly unified, meaning there is a lot of different sounds available on different manuals, so the organist has at their command going from one sound to another sound at any given time uh, to portray what they need to on the screen. Accompanying what goes on on the screen not only has music from all the sounds of an orchestra, it also has sound effects. For an example, if I start way up here with a cymbal, that's part of an orchestra, but I can then use my foot on the pedal and there's my crash cymbal. On this side of the organ, I have a sound of escaping air that's called surf. And right below that is an automobile horn. This first one that I skipped over is a 1947 Cadillac ambulance siren. Then as we go across, I'm going to open up this sound here so that you can hear. I can make a streetcar bell. That streetcar bell, if I hold it down with my foot, becomes a fire alarm. That goes along with the siren. The next. A whistle, a bird. Then next to that is the train whistle. So if I want to make a train, I have to use voices for the chuff, 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 but that train whistle sounds accurate. So those are the sound effects that you don't usually see and hear 
on a classic organ. These buttons that are underneath each keyboard are the pistons that set the stops. Watch how they change when I push this button with my thumb. Now it's all ready to go and I can play whatever sound comes up that is on that setting. I hope I didn't deafen you on that. Over in that corner, notice a piano. That piano is a real piano. The different styles of sound that you have heard, like the Phantom of the Opera sound, can have something that is quite different and charming. So anything is needed, we can get it here. Tonight we hopefully have a group of people who have never experienced a silent, so-called silent film uh, with a live accompaniment. Uh, watching a, a silent film made in the silent era on a DVD is not the same experience as it is with an audience. Uh, the General is uh, one of the, not only one of Buster Keaton's great films, but one of the all-time classic silent films of any film. It's interesting in uh, looking back at the way the film was received when it came out in uh, 1927. Uh, Variety, which was the, uh, the magazine that the theaters depended on to know whether a film was worth playing or not, called it a flop. And they blamed it on Buster Keaton. And they said, you cannot make a film in which the majority of the film is a one gag thing of a chase. And, uh, you, you wonder if when they saw it, if they were seeing it in a screening room without music and without an audience. Every audience is different. And their reactions to what we are all looking at on the screen at the same time tells me what I can get away with when I share with them the emotions that are on that screen. There is a responsibility also in me as a performer because what I do in response to theirs, their responses, tells me and them both that we share this feeling at this moment. They paid money to come for some sort of a reward, some sort of a feeling. And I have a responsibility and therefore an accountability for the influence that I have on audiences. These audiences are going to be part of our society. So what I do is literally a social power. So uh, it's, to me, it's been a, a very uh, great opportunity 
to watch audiences respond to something that uh, they think is uh, antique and obsolete and they come out with an entirely different feeling for what silent film really was. Uh, I don't know, I suppose that if you've never had the experience of seeing a foreign film and uh, you have to go to a, a foreign film and read subtitles, that's a new experience uh, for people. I, re I remember going to the Tower Theater as a teenager and as they brought films in from France and Germany and having that experience of subtitles. And it, it took getting used to. But I found that there was a, a whole uh, array of films that were great experiences that uh, I wouldn't have had if I hadn't learned to do that. And I think uh, silent film is the same way. We step back into that early period of filmmaking and no, there's no dialogue, but we find out uh, that not every film was great, but the films were, had a way of uh, expressing themselves in a different form and yet reaching people. And uh, they can still do it today the same way they did uh, in the uh, teens and the, and the 20s if they are given the opportunity. When you have uh, young adults come up after a show there and they want to linger and talk to Blaine and ask you questions because they're overwhelmed about what they have just experienced and their whole concept of silent movies has changed. That's pretty exciting. When you realize, I mean, you know, we talk about stereophonic sound now and uh, uh, this place has thousands of pipes that surround you. It's more stereophonic sound than uh, any theater ever had or ever will have. Tonight's screening of The General gives people who are experiencing a silent film for the first time an opportunity to see uh, one of the true masterpieces of silent or sound. It's a comedy that will be shown 100 years from now, 200 years from now, because it will never grow old. It's been almost five years since we had Spectrum Academy up north of Salt Lake here bring students down here to the organ loft. They came for a fundraiser for a silent film from the public, but in the afternoon before that evening's performance, the students lined up here with parents, teachers, clinicians, and those autistic students responded in ways that amazed the caregivers and the parents who knew them very well but had not seen them react in the same way. They were reacting based upon their peers and upon others who were reacting to what they saw. That gave a type, a method to their understanding their own reactions different from what they'd had before, different from in a school or a home setting, or a clinic setting. This is out in public in a theatrical setting. Their focus of attention on the film, of course, was the main thing that attracted them and held them. And what they saw in the emotions and the actions going on on the screen, they were told how to respond by me sitting here telling them with sound, with music, not words and they responded to what they heard as well as to what they saw. And the two together was something totally different. I hope to be able to give that experience to those who have autism in our community. At the present time, I have a list of approximately two dozen, little more than two dozen people who have expressed interest in becoming students to the Silent Movie Accompanist Center for the Performing Arts. That's SMAC, S-M-A-C. And that's a four-part college course that I've designed and it continually changes as times change and things are needed differently. That four-part course for these people on the list has to start up in groups of six students, ideally. Can be less, one-on-one -on -one is possible, but if I can have six students, they learn from each other's needs, from each other's reticence and problems, and watch and gain their confidence 
by sharing with a, a class of six students. The students of this art form then would have something specifically important for them to learn and to know, and that is how to express emotion to autistic students based upon what you were all viewing together. To get that going, we need more instruments available to them. This instrument is the largest in Utah that would be available to those students. This six, or excuse me, this five keyboard 36 rank instrument is largest. Then down the road a piece, the Capitol Theater has only two manuals and 11 voices or ranks. But those two instruments here in Salt Lake City, as different as they are, are the same in the fact that their voices are the theater, uh, are the uh, pit orchestra for the theater to, to play. And the one in the Capitol Theater is a Wurlitzer, the same as this one. And farther up the road in Ogden, we have three manuals and 23 ranks or voices. Another Wurlitzer in the Paris Egyptian Theater. Farther up the road in Logan, at the Utah Theater, the uh, Utah, uh, the opera, Utah Festival Opera Company with uh, Michael Ballam, his instrument is three keyboards and 16 ranks or voices. These are at the end of the tunnel for any student who goes through the time that it takes to form the habits of playing a theater organ. Those habits are the familiarity with voices, how they sound, how to mix them, the same way someone would write music for an orchestra and bring out the various instruments. That's how this person on the bench becomes the composer and the whole orchestra at the same time. It's possible that this facility here and this instrument and this screen will be matched soon just very close, four blocks up the street on 33rd South here, when another facility has the same capacity with another instrument, a digital one, to do exactly the same kind of influence, if you will, that could be then used to make this a, a real uh, authorized form of therapy. It first has to go through studies. So the studies would have to be done by the experts. We're looking forward to a national convention of the American Theater Organ Society here in Utah, drawn here by these four mighty Wurlitzers, which is rather an unusual phenomenon in the world of music. Charlie Chaplin wrote music, and some of the music that he wrote that we perform here is familiar to the public, among which is this one. It's going to require more people learning the art of the organ, and I think there are plenty of college uh, students coming out that have a love for film that could step in and do uh, programming and they'd have all kinds of films that they'd like to play. So I think that part, I could be replaced. That part could be done. But it's gonna take uh, organist. Because my age is getting to what it is, 80 years old coming up this next birthday, it's time for me to be certain that I pass this torch of my bias, if you will, my uh, desire on to other people and if we can get more students and more individuals who have music in their heart to do this art form each one is going to have their particular style just like i do well it's kind of the same problem we're dealing with as finding organists to play this instrument uh, you know finding somebody that is interested in doing what i'm doing uh, if it comes by i'd be great, you know, to teach somebody what I know, but um, I don't know. 
I think it might just end with me. <laughs>